Hello friend, I have a story to tell you today. It's the story of my daughter's life. She died of lung cancer at the age of 39 and I have written a book, a book which I think is helpful to us today in the very difficult circumstances in which we live. It brings hope and encouragement and a sense that all is well. I hope you enjoy it. Episode 15 Hi, Katie, Shirley says, relieved when Katie answers. Listen, could you come over? I wouldn't ask, but I really need you. Nick has driven her home after the cancer diagnosis and soothed her with hugs and gentle words. But right now, she needs someone with her, someone with skin on. Katie loves Shirley because she's so spontaneous, open and lovable. But for quite some time now, she's known a different Shirley. One of the things that worries Katie is Shirley's yo-yo relationship with God. One minute, Shirl says, I've been finding a lot easier to involve God in the details of my life, and so I feel very peaceful. The next minute, she's angry and dismisses him for letting her down all over again. God has asked Katie to take special care of Shirley, so she's mega kind whenever Shirley phones, sometimes in the middle of the night. Now they talk for quite some time. They are both numbed by shock. It feels the most natural thing in the world to pray, and they do. As Katie drives home, she says to herself, Shirley of all people? How's she ever going to cope? She'll never cope with cancer. What about God, Shirley wonders. The men I've known have let me down. Now that I have cancer, Will he let me down as well? Her mind continues to comb out tangles of deception, but what she needs right now is not argument, but relationship. I come to the garden alone, she hums, while the dew is still on the roses. And he walks with me, and he talks with me. God seems to be in almost every entry in her diary, that means that he's there now, and they stroll together. Come to me with an open mind and heart, Jesus says. Allow me to plant my desires within you. She responds, I need you more than anything else. Please, this thing's terrible. Help me to wait, trust, and know that you are God. One moment she can't believe God cares about her. Then it is she ends up feeling like I have no roots, been listening to crappy voices telling me that I've messed everything up. That's also when hot tears blot the page as she scribbles. Hmm, problem. With sleepiness, distractions this morning, cup of torment time? She scratches through the kitchen drawer that's stuffed with a mishmash of medicines. She swallows several pills and waits for answers that don't come. Suddenly, there's a sharp tap-tap on her front door. Shirley jumps up, glad of the interruption. Oh, sure, says Katie. I've escaped for the morning. Amelia's gone to a friend, and suddenly I have a little time on my hands, so I'm back again. She thrusts a packet of yummy doughnuts into Shirley's hands. Delighted, Shirley makes coffee. It takes her a while to find clean mugs. How are you? Katie asks and curls up on the couch to listen. Do you really want to know? This could take a long time, Shirley giggles, her special giggle, which makes Katie smile too. You ask how I am, right now, numb, confused, frightened, struggling to believe any of this is true. I've been looking back in my diary and found this, 19 September 2012, Jesus, most constant companion and guide ever. Um, and then, let me see, 20 September, Lord, please give me the strength to focus on you before everything else. Practice saying, I trust you in every circumstance. Still need to move to that place where I'm passionately in love with God. Hmm, Katie's pensive as she bites into her donut. I bet there's a lot of more in there that will make very interesting reading, she teases. Serious again, they flip through more entries. You know what, Charles? I can see progress. 
you've put down what was in your head, but you're not leaving it there. You're applying what you know, and that's real progress. I don't follow. You know in your head that Jesus is with you in every circumstance. So what do you do? You start asking him for his help, which you now seem to value a great deal. I have changed a bit, but the snag remains to hold on to the new things, the new beliefs. I still keep blowing hot and cold. Actually, I'm seeing you blow more and more hot and less and less cold. He's busy with you, you know. So hand over. He's the key to success and not you. The conversation moves on to a new colour in nail varnish, shower gel that has a wonderful smell, scarves at half price at Sainsbury's and other such feminine concerns. Katie's right though. There's an awful lot of interesting stuff in Shirley's diary. 9 October 2012. Brokenness and repentance lead to abandonment. We'll never abandon ourselves to the spirit as long as we think we can change without him. Larry Crabb. Ask the spirit to penetrate to the exact centre of my heart. Find the empty hole and fill it with God's love. This is where the rubber has always hit the road for Shirley. She notes, God says, for love of you I left my father's side. I came to you. You ran from me. You fled from me. You didn't want to hear my name. For love of you I was covered in spit, punched and beaten. For love of you I stayed with you and hold you every day of your life. Jesus in the message. Smudges on the diary page reveal some considerable crying. In the circumstances that come up in my life, am I so undergirded by the love of God that I can let him take me through them? Her struggles fill more pages. Sometimes the smudges are coffee and not tears. Just once it's Marmite. A really big mistake has been trying to work her life out for herself. Another, she admits, has been to live utterly selfishly. Typically, she sees failure and not much else. But at times, as she keeps company with God, he blesses her with special encouragements. It's in such gentle fellowship with him that she realizes that in his eyes there's nothing wrong with her. And at long last, she sporadically knows some satisfaction for the yearning that has perpetually parched her soul. Every now and then she gets to slake her thirst for him just a little more. At some point she's taken the trouble to gold frame Psalm 16 from verse 5. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. You fill me with the joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. On Facebook, Shirley writes, Every day I have choices to make. There are good ones and bad ones. The big one is, do I believe God loves me? Here it is again, her biggest, the one big realization she needs for what lies ahead. Now, when the crunch comes and Shirley has cancer, the strolls in the garden with Jesus bear fruit. God has been knocking for a lifetime, her lifetime. Now it is cancer that turns the key. And now nothing can restrain God's love on hold for so long. The most plaintive words of Jesus are the heart-stopping question, Do you love me? When Shirley answers yes, how different her Gethsemane becomes from what it might have been. She says of this terrifying Gethsemane, I was filled with pure, pure disbelief. No, disbelief isn't the right word. I did believe what was happening to me, but I think I had no concept of what that was actually going to mean. She looks back over her life and very haltingly and tentatively, she faces what she can understand of the future. This is what has moved her towards facing her Gethsemane choices, mainly in the small hours of the morning. Then she phones. Mum, she says, stunning me, now it's time to cut my crap. The words are heavily pregnant with resolve. My eyes stand on stalks. Really? She's thinking that? 
She's never, ever called her struggles crap before. Never. Amazingly, Shirley says it again. With impressive resolve, she declares even more firmly, I'm going to cut my crap and do it with God, Mum. My cry to God becomes, What now? How can I help Shirley now? The mantra of my life has been to help Shirley. On the 28th of November, 2012, I record in my diary God's gentle but clear advice. Now you can cut the umbilical cord. I'm totally shocked. To no longer need to compensate for what was missing in her will set me free. I can't do that, I respond. She'll sink. I know that will bring on the disaster I've worked so hard and long to prevent, but God persists. What I needed you to do is in the past. I no longer need you to do that. It's over now. Trust me. I struggle to get my mind around this. I'm not called upon to parent anymore, and I don't have to do cancer for her. I can see that right from the start. Shirley takes the cancer in hand. Amazingly. No, miraculously, there's no doubt about that. So I do actually very gently cut the umbilical cord. It happens so unobtrusively that even I don't notice that I'm doing it. God gives me time. Months later, I begin to recognize that what I'm feeling is relief, a huge burden lifted. But it is only with hindsight that I get to understand that this is what I've done. God makes it clear that basically from now on, I'm to keep quiet. Others will do what I was doing, point the way. That's not my job anymore. When I get to England, I'm to see to everyone's needs and to love and encourage them. I'm to do the driving, to organize, manage the household, book appointments, make coffee, clean house, do the flowers, feed the cats, do the washing, answer the phone, comfort, encourage, shop, fetch meds, and pray. I've been reading from my book, Mum, Please Help Me Die, the story of my daughter Shirley's battle with cancer. If you'd like to get a copy of the book, please contact me. You can do that at the following email address, thigh at mumplpleasehelpmedie.co.za. I hope you'll be with me again next week. Goodbye.